It's confession time on this week's podcast. Apart from chocolate, Craig has another addiction. Learn all about it and some stationary vocabulary on this episode of Aprender Inglés con Reza y Craig. And welcome. If you're a new listener, my name's Craig. And my name's Reza. And with over 40, well, it must be nearly 50 years now of teaching experience between us, we're going to help you grow your grammar, vocalize your vocabulary, and perfect your pronunciation, taking all your English to the next level. Hi, Reza. Hi, how are you, Craig? I'm very well, thank you. Looking forward to helping the listeners take their English to the next level? And speak about my fetish and my obsession that I've had since I was a child. But before we get into that, do we have any feedback? We do. Let's kick off with a voice message all the way from Russia. Wow. This is Olga from Russia. Let's listen to Olga. Hi, Craig and Teresa. My name is Olga. I'm not from Spain or Latin America. I'm from Russia. I hope you don't mind. Thank you for an amazing podcast. I'm very grateful for it. And I have some questions. For example, I'm wondering, how do you call the noon? Is it 12 a.m. or 12 p.m.? And also the same question about midnight. Uh, I'd be very grateful if you could clarify this for me and for others as well. Uh, thank you once again. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Cheers. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much for your message. Didn't she have wonderful pronunciation, Olga? Fantastic. Very good pronunciation, Olga. Very, very, very good. Very clear. We understood every word. So her question is about noon. Can, can I just say something before we get to the question? Of, we understood you perfectly, but there was one tiny little mistake. You said, how do you call the noon? When you should say, how do you say Yes, yeah, so for asking the meaning of a word in English, it's how do you say, not call. How do you say? And it's not the noon, is it? It's noon. Noon. Yeah, you added the. Ooh, I know that the word the is very t tricky for all speakers. And I've been told that it's particularly tricky for Russian speakers. Yes. I've taught Russian speakers and they've told me that they have great difficulty with the word the because of the the, the way the article works in Russian, it doesn't correspond with English at all. And we no. have spoken about the articles in English, uh, and the in detail. So if you want to find that episode, go to the webpage and in the search box, just type article and you'll find podcasts that we've, we've taught that in. But we're being, we're being a bit fussy. Yes. Yeah. We're being too particular. Olga, your message was as clear as day and your pronunciation was excellent. And actually, that's a very interesting question, Olga, because not everybody agrees when, if 12 o'clock is p.m. or 12 o'clock is a.m. Well, what do you think, Reza? Do you have an opinion on this? Because I, I am quite opinionated on this. As far as I know, okay. the way I was taught, it is very clear, although I've had many discussions about this, at 12 a.m. is the middle of the night. It's midnight. 12 a.m. is midnight. So as soon as the clock goes from 11.59 to 12 at night, that becomes a.m. Yes, and the logic is it's the next day. I agree with the logic. However, p.m. in Latin is post meridium, which is after midday, and a.m. is anti meridium, before midday. Right. So by that logic, if it's 12 o'clock, it's what? Oh, but hold on, I've had this discussion. <laughs> it depends on how you look at it. Midnight, it could, uh, my justification is it's a.m. because it's now 12 hours before midday. You've got 12 to go before midday. Ah, right. It, but you could say no. You could say midnight. It's 12 yeah. hours after midday. After it, it depends yeah. how you want to look at it, you know. 
What I have noticed is that in a lot of computer software, PM begins at 12 o'clock midday. So uh, it will be it will be 11.59 a.m. And then when it hits 12 noon, that becomes PM. But that is what software developers think or agree is when PM begins. But and as I said, not everybody agrees. And I think I agree with Reza. But I think the safest thing is to use the 24-hour clock, as they do in the army. So 1 p.m. is 1,300 hours, and then it's clear. Yeah. And that's what I do in emails, and when I'm trying to fix a time with someone, make an appointment, I always say, let's meet at 1,700, which is 5 p.m. But we, we hope we've answered your question, Olga, at least about noon. Noon is the middle of the day which can also, of course, be called midday. And midnight would be 12 o'clock. But the let's look quickly at the clarification of good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, because I think the Spanish divide the day a bit differently than we do. Yeah. For example, buenas tardes, when would you say that? After 2 p.m.? <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure you've had plenty of uh, because discussions Because buenas dias this. is until 2 p.m. I'm no expert in this. Obviously, I'm, I'm not a native Spanish speaker, although Craig and I, we've lived here a long time. And what most Spanish speakers tell me is that it depends. It depends on, above all, if you've eaten or not. Okay. Um, it tends to be that after you've had your lunch, if you had your lunch at more or less the normal Spanish time, which is sometime between half one and kind of half three, uh, once you've eaten, then it's buenas tardes. Right. Before you eat, it's buenos dias. And indeed, I've seen Spanish people in Spain greet each other where one says buenas tardes. And the one who answers sometimes says buenos dias. That's probably me because I get confused. <laughs> but well, it could be, and I've seen native speakers do it, native Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. So it, it doesn't seem to be strict. Perhaps the one who said buenos dias hasn't had his lunch yet and he still feels it's morning. Yep. Whereas the one who says buenos tardes has, it's probably about two o'clock in the afternoon. So Maybe it depends what time clear. you get up out of bed as well. But in English, I think, uh, we'll see if you agree with this, Reza, before 12 noon, it's good morning. Yeah, it's science. Yeah. After 12 noon, midday, it's good afternoon. Yeah. And would you agree that before 6 is good afternoon and after 6 p.m. is good evening? More or less, but I, I don't think you can be quite as strict as that. I mean, afternoon is what it says, afternoon. So if noon's 12... Afternoon is after 12. That's scientific. But would you say good afternoon at 7 p.m.? Well, that's the thing. When does the evening begin? Yeah. When's the evening? Maybe it depends on the time of the year because in summer you have longer days. Right. Right. But good night, I would definitely say before I go to bed or before I leave somewhere to go home. Right. It's a way of saying goodbye, isn't it? Rather yeah. than... Rather than greeting, un saludo, rather than saying hello, good night, it's more typical to say goodbye, isn't it? Right. Evening, for me personally, Craig, it's a t around about six, but that's because we were both brought up in the UK, and that's about the time you have your dinner or your tea. It's tea time. And I, for me, it's whichever comes first, whether darkness falls or you've had your tea. You've had your dinner. Then after that, it's evening. So it could be good evening from about half past four or five onwards in, in Scotland in winter because it's dark. Mm -hmm. You'll hear people say good evening at five o'clock. Yeah. Whereas in the summertime where it's bright in, say, Scotland until about 11 o'clock at night, people will probably wait until about six or half past six or seven before they say good evening because they've had the tea. Yeah. Would you say that's it yep. more or less? Have you had your tea? <laughs> <laughs> Very Scottish, isn't it? You'd have had your tea. But what, what would you say about that theory? Yeah, or even maybe later in the summer when it gets dark around nine or half past nine sometimes, then mm -hmm. good afternoon will be said later i'd be interested to know what they say in america so if you're a spanish speaker living in north america in the united states how do they greet you there is it the same as we've just said in england or or is it different please let us know if you're in the, the usa 
And, and Craig, what about the Australians? Maybe their way is better because they often say g'day. Yeah, which means good day, right? Yeah, it's good day, good day. And that can be said at any time, can't it? Yeah. Good day, mate. No. One, 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 one solution, one size fits all. Good day, mate. We've received another email from our friend Emiliano, Emmy from Argentina, who asked us a couple of questions. Um, Emmy, we answered your question on phrasal verbs back in episode 181. So to brush up, to revise your phrasal verbs, go to englishpodcast.com slash 181. And Emmy also has some questions regarding grammar. First question, when can I use the word ain't? A-I-N apostrophe T. Ain't. First thing, what is ain't? What, what does it well, mean? Well, that ain't easy to answer, is it, Craig? No, it ain't. It ain't easy. <laughs> <laughs> what is ain't? Ain't can be loads of things, can't it? It can mm-hmm. be contractions for, for what? I'm not, is not, are not, have not, has not, do not. Kind of, it's a negative contraction, right? Yeah. Do you agree it's correct? Well, I don't like to say correct English. Would you would you tell your students it's okay to say the word ain't? I would say that they have to use it in the correct situation. In the right context. Yeah. If not, it will sound bad or just silly. It'll sound silly because if they're obviously not native speakers and they say it, 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 it's a bit silly. It's like they're misusing something that they don't really understand. I remember growing up, if my dad said to me, Craig, tidy up your room, clean your room, and I said, I ain't doing that, he would hit me around the head. He would slap me. He said, you don't speak like that. Speak properly. He didn't accept it as correct English. But it's very common. You hear it all the time. You hear it in songs. You hear it in certain dialects, uh, certain areas of, uh, of the US as well. Well, I think that's probably why your dad was a bit annoyed because in the kind of London area or southeast of England, the word ain't is associated with kind of a tough street language of very working class mm-hmm. or kind of uneducated people's language, isn't it? That's yep. the association in the UK. Yep, right? exactly. And, you know... Um, Do people say it in Belfast? We we only say it in Belfast for kind of effect, it's not something which is associated with a social group or class in Belfast. It's not common speech on the, no. sh- on the street. But but we would say things like what you just said, you know, your dad says, tidy your room, you say, I ain't doing it. Like uh, the word ain't as a kind of joke to show your determination. Mm. You know, there's no way I'm going to do it. But it doesn't, it's not something that comes naturally to us like it does to some Londoners. Well, I've got a couple of quite common expressions with ain't in them let me say them and see if you razor can put it into more not acceptable english but more maybe common english what what, what does it actually mean you ain't seen nothing yet the catchphrase (laughs) of al jolson yeah very common expression isn't it you ain't seen nothing yet you haven't seen anything yet next one say ain't so i think that's from a song say ain't so Say it isn't so. Mm-hmm. The creative process ain't easy. The creative process isn't easy. One of my favourite expressions, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, that's very common, isn't it? I love that expression. Yeah. If it isn't broke. Broken. The, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you caught me there. You caught me. There was another colloquialism. The word broke isn't really technically correct. Yeah, you're right. If it isn't broken, past participle, don't fix it. Yeah. And that expression means if something's working, don't change it. Like, you know, if every if everything is going well, why change it? Don't rock the boat. Don't do something different just because you feel like it. Keep it working. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And would you agree that that expression, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, it's very common to use the word ain't in that expression. Yeah. Specifically in that expression. It's a, it's a fixed expression, expression yeah. fickle. So, yeah, it's very common. Next one, a very famous song from Meatloaf, Two Out of Three Ain't Bad. Two Out of Three Isn't Bad. And It Ain't Necessarily So. Another song, isn't it? Yep. It Ain't Necessarily So. so. It Isn't Necessarily So. 
So Emiliano, that's um, one answer for you. Next question was, is there any rule, is there any rule for contractions or apostrophes? I thought that apostrophes should apply for verb contractions like I'm, she's, ain't, (laughs) and so on. But I've seen many words, especially in songs, that do not follow this rule. For example, throw them back. That's throw apostrophe M back. Or bout instead of about. So apostrophe B-O-U-T, bout. Well, that's for a missing letter. If there's a letter missing from a word, you put an apostrophe in the place of the letter. So about, you put an apostrophe where the A is. And T-H-E-M, you put an apostrophe for T-H in them. So if you see an apostrophe, there's some words, some letters missing. And in the case of ain't, well, it's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a mystery or we don't know w- what was originally said because it's A-I-N apostrophe T. Yeah. There is no long form of ain't, it's just ain't. <laughs> there ain't no long form. Because it replaces many things. It can replace am not, is not, are not, has not, etc. So it replaces many things. That's why you don't know. There's another use of the apostrophe. Uh, The possessive apostrophe. This is uh, the pen of razor. It's razor's pen. So there's apostrophe S to mean it belongs to him. This is the car of Craig. It's Craig's car. Um, Next question from Emmy. Could you give me some advice to improve my reading skills? I usually read part by part, and sometimes I'm not able to join the right words, and the expression changes. To hear me, reading is like heard... a well, hearing it should be, is like hearing a six-year-old child reading. Well, we don't usually read aloud, do we? We read Mm. internally, so we don't speak as we read. Any advice on on how he can improve his reading? Because reading, I think, you use as a way of improving pronunciation. Yes, I think it can be used. Record yourself on your mobile or something like that and play it back. And you'll probably notice your own mistakes very easily. You know why? I often say to my students, don't read what you see in English. Read what you know. Mm. I'll give you an example. Even students of a fairly good level, like B1, B2, occasionally C1, they know that uh, carne is pronounced meat. And they might say, I like meat. But you show them that sentence in a, in a book and say, can you read that? And they say, I like meat. Oh, sorry, meat. Like, Why did you say meat? You mm. know the pronunciation meat. Because they're looking at it and they think, oh, I have to pronounce these letters. No, it's meat. So that's why I say, read what you know, not what you see. That's, that's very good advice. Also, listen to audiobooks and compare the person reading with the actual text and then repeat it. So you're listening to a sentence and then repeating it after the person. Finally. Yes, he writes, I'd like to share a curious thing about your name, Reza. Do you know that your name means he or she prays in Spanish? Rezar or rezar is the infinitive of the verb to pray. So your name means to pray, conjugated in the third form of present tense. Yes, I've been living in Spain a long time, so you can imagine I do know that. I had heard that. It's just a pure coincidence, Emmy. It's a coincidence, but a funny one. I kind of like the idea of the the religious uh, coincidence that my name has for Spanish. What are you praying for at the moment? (laughs) More money. So, moving on to the main part of the podcast, my stationary addiction. Yes, I know, it's true. I'm addicted to stationary. Everything connected to stationary. Pens, pencils, paper, folders, envelopes. Um, And I know what you're thinking. That's a bit strange, Craig. Why are you addicted? I don't know. It's something that's been with me since I was a child. When I go into a shop that's selling stationary, It's very difficult for me to leave. I love looking around and touching stationery, and I really get excited from pens and paper. Do you think that's weird? 
Because you didn't know this, did you? I didn't know it, no. But do you know what? I reckon it isn't that uncommon. Uh, I'm not saying it's very common, but I'm sure you're not the only person who really loves and appreciates stationery. That's a relief. Yeah, particularly good quality stationery. Yeah. Uh, I am not obsessed the same way you are, but when I see really good quality stationery compared to bad stuff, I, I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. You know how these days so much stationery is uh, mass produced, probably in, you know, massive factories in China where they can produce them really quickly. But the quality is awful. It's really poor Have you quality. noticed that the pencils in our school, when you try to write with them, they break? They break and, instantly. And then you sharpen them, and they yeah. break again. They break and you sharpen, And they're constantly breaking. They're made in China. They're really bad quality. And it's something that really, really annoys me. Yeah, I, I think that you end up paying more money for the cheap stuff because you hardly get any use out of it. You if have you to bought buy more, yeah. a good quality pencil that sharpens easily and doesn't break, it lasts you longer. It's better value for money. So I appreciate that aspect of stationery, yeah. With the word stationery, let's just clarify. There are two spellings of the word and two meanings. There's stationery with an E which is what we're speaking about in this podcast. That's S-T-A-T-I-O-N-E-R-Y. And there's stationary with an A, S-T-A-T-I-O-N-A-R-Y. So with an A, it's an adjective. For example, it's something that doesn't move. I exercise in the gym on a stationary bike. It doesn't go anywhere. It's fixed. It doesn't move. That's the adjective. And the noun is what we're speaking about today. Office, stationery, pens, pencils, envelopes, etc. If you want to, the way I remember this, if you want to use this, it's uh, try to remember that the E in stationery stands for envelope. So it's pens, pencils, envelopes. The A in stationery with an A is the adjective. So A could be at rest, for example, not moving. So the A is at rest, the adjective, and the E is envelope. Craig, envelope or envelope? Ah, ah. Have, you, have you heard the, the other pronunciation? I have. Is that what you say? I, I usually do say envelope. I think both are accepted, aren't they? Envelope they are. or envelope? Interesting. That sounds quite posh to me. Ooh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you pass me an envelope? <laughs> So let's look at some vocabulary. Maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Hopefully you'll learn something. How do you say grapadora in English? Oh, that's stapler. Stapler. And of course, for the stapler, you'll need the staples as grapas. Uh, staples are one way of keeping paper together. So you staple paper together. Or you could use something that's less permanent. Paper clips. Paper clips. As an example of what we were talking about earlier, and uh, Craig and I agreed on this, quality costs, but it lasts you. I have a stapler at home in my house, which is at least 50 years old. 50? Five zero? Yeah. And wow. it works perfectly. It has never, ever, ever not worked. Not that, one single time. That's very old. It's the stapler which my dad used at his work I think it was the first and only one he ever bought because it was such fantastic quality, German made, that it's still working perfectly now. It has his name on it and I keep it in my uh, in my desk, in my, my room, and I never, ever let, let it leave the house. Do you have any problems getting the staples for it? No, it's a sta standard size. I can get the staples, no problem. That's cool. 50 years and it works perfectly. My Probably staple. made by Hitler. <laughs> Hopefully another, not. <laughs> another kind of clip is a bulldog, a bulldog clip. I don't know how you say that in Spanish, but it's a very big clip that also keeps paper together. And you close your fingers on it, you pinch it, pinchar, and it opens. A bulldog clip. Craig, if I said to you, there's a funny clip you must see. What am I talking about? Probably video, a video clip. Yeah. Yeah, another meaning of clip. You can have a clip round the ear. Yes, another one. <laughs> Someone hits you when, around your head. When Craig said, I ain't tidy in my room, his dad gave him a clip around the ear. Many times. Paper can come blank or lined with lines on it, and it can also come squared. You can have square paper too in a notebook. 
Which is your preference, Craig? Blank or lined? That's a very good question. I could speak about this for hours <laughs> because of my fetish. But uh, it depends what I'm doing. If I'm writing a journal or a diary, I prefer faintly lined paper, which is very Ooh. faint, not very heavy, thick black, but very fine, fido, muy fino, faintly lined paper. Uh, if I'm drawing, then I prefer blank paper. And if I'm doing some kind of, uh, not necessarily a graph, but something where I need lines or boxes, then obviously I like a grid lined paper. What about note paper? Meaning? Paper designed merely to write notes. Definitely lined. Yeah. Right. What about you? Exactly the same as you. Depends what I'm using it for. And uh, Craig, I imagine you have an ample, un amplio, an ample collection of notebooks or jotters. I do. I, I'll take a photo and put it on the uh, in the show notes. But I have a cupboard here, my stationary cupboard, with a selection of notebooks and pens and pencils. I'm actually using three notebooks at the moment: two notebooks and a and a diary, a journal. Uh-huh. So, do you often jot things down? What does that mean? So we said jotter, J O T T E R, is the same as notebook, un cuaderno para notas. So to jot something down is to quickly write a brief note about something. Yeah, I often jot things down, sometimes digitally. If I have my mobile phone on me, it's quicker to just open the notes application. I use Evernote and I write notes in Evernote. But I also like to, to make notes if I'm at my desk on a, with a real pen on paper and keep a notebook of ideas and, and suggestions. So you use post-it notes as well? Yeah, I do use post-it notes every morning. I, this, this sounds really weird. I write the main three things I want to do in one day. So I'll make a quick to-do list of only three things. They're the most important things. And when I complete those three things in one day, then I feel happy and pleased with myself. And that's on a post-it note next to my desk. Uh Craig, what if you have a piece of paper which has no holes in the paper at the margin and margin? Uh, How are you going to make those holes? Well, you need a hole punch, Reza, to punch your holes but i don't think we do this very often these days i can't remember the last time i punched a hole in in or holes in paper do you, do you do that i do from time to time and guess what i have a matching hole punch for my stapler my dad's of 50 years old and it works perfectly so it's a set it's a kit no just well <laughs> you could call it, it's just the stapler and the hole punch it works perfectly yeah it's at least 50 years old and it works like clockwork They don't make them like they used to. (laughs) They really don't. Of course, if you use a hole punch, perforadora, you also need carpeta de arroz, which is a ring binder. Ring binders have rings. You open the rings and you put your newly punched paper into the ring binder. Craig, what if your pencil isn't writing properly? What are you going to need so it writes a bit better? A pencil sharpener. So sharp is the adjective sharp is afilado. For example, you have a sharp knife. And the verb is to sharpen, just add en. So you need to sharpen your pencils. You probably already guessed my pencils are always sharpened on the desk. So sacapuntas, pencil sharpener. Um, Going back to the same old obsession of quality, I have a pencil sharpener, uh, which I use in work. In fact, I have several. But the really good one that I have, the Steitler. I have a Steitler as well. I have a Steitler as well. I lend it to people and my students are getting so sick of hearing this. They say, is it the good one? I say, yeah. I say, you know the drill. You know what you have to do. And they say, yes, return it immediately. Mm -hmm. And I watch them while they're sharpening their pencil and they must immediately return it to me. I don't let it out of my sight for more than about a minute. Well, I'm full of admiration that you even take it into the class. I Mm -hmm. would keep that here at home. Mm -hmm. because things go missing well i give out the crappy the not very good quality chinese ones first yeah but if they're all used i say okay you're getting the statler but you have to be very quick and return it to me Speaking of sharp and sharpest and sharpened, there's an expression that I quite like. He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Tool is armienta, and shed is a small place in your garden where you keep your tools. What do you think that means, Reza? He's not the sharpest tool in the shed. 
he's not very bright. He's not very intelligent. It's a euphemism for that. Mm-hmm. Craig, if something's not sharp, it's what? The opposite, blunt. B-L-U-N-T. Desafilado. And if you said that a person was blunt or something somebody said, a statement, a blunt statement, what would that mean? Well, if a, a person is blunt, then they're very direct or they're very direct. They tell you exactly what they're thinking. So that's rather blunt or he's a blunt person means they say exactly what they're thinking. They don't care about your feelings too much. They tell the truth. Uh, a blunt statement is muy franco, franca. It's a very honest, very very sincere statement. Uh, Craig, uh, you like stationery. You talked about your fetish. Do you use rubbers a lot in, uh, in connection to this fetish? Be careful. I know, <laughs> I know where you're going with this. I know where you're going with this. Be careful of the word rubber. Rubber is goma. It's the material and it's the thing in the UK that you use to rub out your mistakes in pencil. However... It's not the same word in the US. In the US, they say eraser because rubber in American English is a condom. So don't make the mistake of going into a chemist in the US and saying, can I have a rubber? Uh, A stationer, sorry. (laughs) Don't go into a stationer's in the US and say, can I have a rubber? And Americans find it very funny when when British people say things like, would you like to borrow my rubber? This is very hilarious (laughs) for them. Yeah, because it means condom. Craig, now, another piece of stationery which is not so commonly used, but it's useful from time to time, is what you and I would probably call sellotape, right? Would you normally use the word sellotape? Yeah, even though it's the name of a company, it's a trademark, um, sellotape is really common. So you'd say, can you pass me the sellotape? But really, it's sticking tape, which is not a branded name. So sticky tape or sticking tape, is, is what it is, but everybody says sellotape. You say sellotape, right? Usually, yeah. yeah. Although I think Americans would probably say scotch tape. Oh, yes, which is another which is trademark. Another, another brand. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's from Scotland. No. <laughs> so there was a trademark, sellotape and scotch tape. How do you say pegamento in English? Glue or adhesive. Adhesive sounds more formal, but quite often that's what's written on the package. But mostly we say glue in everyday life. And you can glue or stick something as the verb, to glue or stick. If you make a mistake when you're writing, use Tipex, which is like sellotape, another trademark and brand name. It's correcting fluid, correcting fluid. So pass the glue, pass the Tipex, pass the sellotape. Scissors, scissors, quite difficult to say, S-C-I-S-S-O-R-S, tijeras, scissors. It's a plural noun, so you need a pair of a pair of scissors, or just scissors. Can you pass me the scissors, please? Scissors. Now, a ruler could be one of two things. It could be a piece of stationery, una regla, or it could be a person who rules, like uh, the ruler of the the country is often the prime minister. The person who rules the government is the ruler. So it can be the person who governs or rules, or it can be una regla. Yep. A folder is carpeta, and then you have files, which is the same, carpeta, isn't it? Carpetas, files, or folders? No, hold on. Strictly speaking, a folder is carpeta and file is expediente. Okay, the yeah, the X files, yeah. expediente X, yeah. Where do you put your files? Well, you put them in a filing cabinet, un archivo, or just a file cabinet. And please do not fall for that classic false friend mistake in Spanish. Uh, carpeta is not carpet. Many British people, most British people, have plenty of carpet all over their house on the floor. La moqueta, la moqueta. Carpet is not carpeta. Good point. I use index cards quite a lot for writing notes, especially giving presentations. Index cards are fichas. Where do you throw all your notepaper, index cards and rubbish that you don't need? Ideally, I would say a waste paper basket. I wouldn't. I'd say a rubbish bin. 
Aha, uh-huh, right. You'd use in Ireland, they'd say in Northern Ireland, they'd say waste paper basket. No, no, no. I said ideally, oh, ideally, okay. <laughs> because in my mind, a waste paper basket is really for stationery. You're right. A rubbish bin could be for plastic or um, food. Yeah, yeah. And in America, they would probably say trash can, mm-hmm. trash, rubbish. But for me, waste paper basket is really designed for stationery above all although you can put other things in it if you if you want i suppose how do you say chinchetas well in the uk we say drawing pins uh, which is a strange word i think because you don't have to use them for drawing Uh, you can use them for many things but we call them drawing pins but in america they call them thumbtacks Mm -hmm. that's thumb as in uh one of your fingers tacks T-A-C-K-S. Sometimes it can be confusing, the idea of uh, diaries, the difference between a diary and a journal. You can have, and I have, an appointment diary. Uh, Well, actually, now I don't. Now I use Google for my appointments. So if I have to go to the doctor at 3 o'clock on Thursday, or if I have to teach a class at 7.15 on Friday, that goes in my Google Calendar. But some people use a paper diary for appointments. If you're a businessman or a businesswoman, you'd use an appointment diary. A journal is something different. What do you understand by journal, Reza? Uh, It's particularly common in American English. And a journal is like your personal diary where you write about what you've done each day. I get the feeling that journal is more of an American expression and diary is more British English. So just to clarify, a personal journal is diario and a scheduling diary is agenda. I must tell the listeners that Craig showed me something very beautiful. He showed me a lovely pen he's got. Not any old pen, because there are pens and there are pens. This was a lovely fountain pen. Pluma. Pluma, Una pluma, fountain pen. I love the Spanish word pluma. It's it's feather, isn't it? So yeah. they go back to when people used to write with feathers. Feathers. And I checked this before the podcast because I didn't want to get it wrong. It's the same word in Spanish for a quill. Mm-hmm. They also say pluma because the idea is the same. But a quill in English is when it really is a feather. It really is la pluma de la ave and nothing else dipped into ink, like Shakespeare would have used, or Cervantes. We call that in English a quill, but the slightly more modern version, which is a type of pen, which you also call pluma, that's what we call fountain pen. And there's another little word that uh, I'll mention only for people who, like me, love stationery, and that's the word nib, N-I-B. Now, nib is the tip, the, the end of the pen, particularly when it's a fountain pen, it's the piece that touches the paper, that's the nib of the pen. Yeah. So that's for fountain pens, not for ballpoint pens, because a ballpoint pen doesn't have a nib. It has a ball which revolves. For example, biros are a type of ballpoint pen. You don't often hear that word in Spain, but it's quite common in the UK. They use the trademark biros, a company to say, can you lend me a biro? Although perhaps it's getting a bit old fashioned, but still it's used sometimes. I think that's the guy who invented it. There's a guy called Biro who uh, invented the, the Biro pen. That's why it's that's Biro. Although in Spain these days, pro- people probably know Bic more. Mm-hmm. But we don't really say in English, can you lend me a Bic, do we? We say, can, can you lend me a pen? Or perhaps a Biro. We wouldn't Biro. really say Bic, would we? No. So what do you think, Reza? Do you think my addiction is normal? Do you think it's strange? When I walk into a stationer's, I get the smell of the paper and I just love touching the the different opening, the the, the notebooks and smelling them. Is that weird? No, I quite enjoy it myself. No, I wouldn't go specially into a stationer's for that reason, but um, I admire the quality and if... If the paper has that fresh smell, I kind of like it. I reckon it's 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 fairly common, although perhaps you're quite a bit more obsessed than most people about it. <laughs> uh, you know, my mum worked in a stationer's for many years. Yeah. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, she did. And she used to say, she, this is not my idea, this is my mum, right? She used to say that you can judge a man, not a woman, eh? Very sexist. You can judge a man by the quality of his stationery. 
Because as we mentioned earlier, not every pen is a Mont Blanc. Craig has a Mont Blanc. They're like the the Rolls Royce of pens. So I think your mum would approve of my choice of stationery. Yeah. How could we apply that to the modern world? Perhaps nowadays you could judge a man by his IT equipment, a 21st century version. Does he have an Apple or an Android? What phone does he carry? Yeah. It's all image these days. Do you you reckon there are people who consider that? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I think people tend to judge other people by the phone they carry, by um, the technology they use, definitely. Oh, the clothes they wear. Yeah, it's connected. Let's look at some stationary idioms to finish. Can you think of any idioms that have reference to stationary that we can help our listeners with? Yes. If you're a very busy person, you could say, I don't have time to put pen to paper recently. In other words, these days I'm very, very busy. I can't even stop to write. Red tape. Another one. My application is being held up by red tape. The phrasal verb held up is delayed. So my application is delayed because of red tape. Red tape here is bureaucracy. A person can be a pen or a pencil pusher. He's only a pen pusher. He, he, he's nothing. He's not important. He's, he's a, a person who sits around an office. He's an administrator who works in an office. How boring. It's used in a derogatory way. Yeah, someone with no influential uh, position. We said before we talked about rubbing and a rubber to rub out something. So you rub out pencil with a rubber or an eraser. eraser or not, an e- not with resin. No, not with resin. <laughs> Please. With, sorry. <laughs> with an eraser if you're in the US. So that phrasal verb to rub out can also be used idiomatically as uh, the meaning of to kill someone. So you could say the mafia rubbed him out for irritating them or for stealing the heroin. So he was rubbed out by a mafia boss. So rub out, eliminate. You can eliminate the pencil on the paper and you can eliminate someone by killing them, by rubbing them out. Well, now it's your turn to practice your English. Do you have a strange addiction or fetish like Craig (laughs) and his stationery? Please tell us about it. Do you have one that you'd like to share with the listeners? Oh, some other day. We'll keep that for the future. (laughs) Please tell us about it and, and uh, we can start thinking that uh, maybe it's normal if, if lots of you write in with the same uh, obsession. Maybe you don't need psychiatric help after all. You have to rubber stamp my, my fetish of stationery. Send us a voice message to speakpipe.com slash podcast or send us an email with a comment or a question to me, Craig, at com or to belfastreza at gmail.com. And we'd like to take a a couple of minutes to thank our sponsors, in particular Bruno, our gold sponsor on Patreon, um, who has a company called Copenhagen Walking Tours. If you are thinking of going to Copenhagen, why not get in touch with Bruno to help you get to know the city? He has castle tours. He has walking tours, both in English or Spanish. And uh, also, if you're going to Rio, why not take his favela walking tour? led by local guides only. It's very safe. It helps the community to improve on their daily needs. And recently, Bruno sent me a CNN documentary that they made about his his tours in Rio. I watched it. It was really nice to see Bruno in the documentary. And if you'd like to watch that as well, I'll put the links to favelawalkingtour.com and the CNN documentary and also Copenhagen Walking Tours all in the show notes to this episode. Reza, who are our other patrons of the show? Thanks to all our patrons who are Beatriz, Pedro, Maite, Lara, Rafa Banthels, Nestor Garcia Mañez from Luces Estrañas, NestorGM.com, Maria, Lorena, Sara, Carlos, Mamen, Juan, Cory Finneram from IVNB.com, Mirin, Jose Luis, Agus, Mariel, Manuel Garcia, Jorge Jimenez, Raul Lopez, Rafael, Manuel Tarazona, and thanks for increasing your donation, by the way, Manuel, Jose Manuel, Juan Carlos, Pilar Martinez, Gan Bate Blog, Anna Giovanna, Igor, and our latest patrons, Kieran and Ignacio Espona. And of course, once again, thanks to Bruno, our gold sponsor. Yeah, thanks everyone, guys and girls. We really appreciate it. 
Many of you um, are asking for full transcriptions of the podcast. That's why this patron program exists. Also, thank you to Patricia Alonso, who continues working hard to transcribe episodes for you for free. So you can go to the website and look at episodes 131 to 142 and episodes 1 to 14. Thank you so much, Patricia, for your hard work. What's next week, Reza? On next week's episode, Wales. That's the country, Wales. Not the fish. Not the fish. Till then, it's goodbye from me. And bye-bye from me. The music in this podcast is by Pitts. The track is called See You Later. 